could include fight, flight, or freeze reaction. Um, and, they, and those reactions can be re-experienced later on if a person is triggered or re-traumatized. Um, what we might see as an um, when we observe a person is, um, you know, there might be sweating, a change of breathing, they might seem tense, a flood of strong emotions, startle response, um, inability to concentrate, inability to speak. They might seem disconnected or have dissociation. Um, trauma frequently produces a sense of fear, shame, and helplessness in the person. Uh, it can lead to emotional numbness, disconnection, um, as well as um, intrusive thoughts, flashbacks, nightmares. Um, and so all these experiences can interfere with a person's sense of safety and self-efficacy, as well as their ability to regulate emotions and navigate relationships. And this can be seen when they're seeking services. Some people develop PTSD, but not all people develop PTSD. So trauma is very common, and among all Canadians, 76% of adults report some form of trauma exposure in their lifetime. 9.2% of these people will meet criteria for PTSD. 33% um, of men and 50% of Canadian women have survived at least one incident of sexual or physical violence. So these numbers show that trauma is extremely prevalent. A history of trauma um, and symptoms of PTSD is especially prevalent in the population we serve. So smokers are twice as likely to have PTSD than non-smokers. Um, and so smokers who have PTSD exhibited more negative affect, had higher rates of comorbid psychiatric illness. It took them more quit attempts um, to, to quit smoking, and they have higher relapse rates. Also, PTSD symptoms and smokers were associated with expectations that smokers would reduce, that smoking will reduce the negative affect. So, in turn, people smoke more to, to reduce a negative affect, and they have higher rates of nicotine dependence. So because this history of trauma really interferes with smoking cessation um, in all these ways, um, it's really important to know about it and, and be able to address it in our clients and our patients. So trauma-informed care has been a buzzword for the last um, 10 to 15 years, uh, but what is it? So trauma-informed care is an approach that comes from an understanding that many of the people we encounter are likely to have experienced some kind of trauma. So we therefore need to incorporate our knowledge of trauma and its effects on people into all aspects of service delivery. Um, so we can avoid re-traumatization and really do no harm. Trauma-informed care is not the same as trauma-specific services, so I really want to highlight that. Trauma-specific services more directly address the impact of trauma, and they facilitate trauma recovery and healing. Um, Trauma-informed care, the focus is on safety and engagement. And a trauma-informed approach can be implemented in any type of service setting or organization. Um, the people who are doing the trauma-informed care do not have to be trauma specialists. And trauma-informed care really paves the way for people to consider taking further steps towards healing and recovery. So, um, you know, having a history of abuse can teach children to avoid speaking up or questioning authority figures. 
In adulthood, um, survivors may then have difficulty expressing their needs to a healthcare practitioner who's perceived as an authority figure. So in this way, in other ways, treatment might um, be threatening. It might trigger um, the trauma. It might precipitate flashbacks or overwhelming emotions such as fear, anxiety, terror, grief, anger, and um, the survivors may act those out. Uh, many service providers, and in may, many cases, the person who has experienced the trauma themselves can misunderstand these difficulties, um, and they can be misdiagnosed as something else because they really don't understand how abuse, trauma, and its effects can reverberate throughout a person's life. So as one male survivor of childhood sexual abuse put it, because otherwise we need trauma-informed care because otherwise you're going to have a certain segment of patients that are going to walk away feeling as though they've been abused all over again, quietly abused, just walking away and seeking another healthcare practitioner, just going through the cycle again and again and again, and maybe not understanding why, maybe not knowing how to say it, how to voice that, just keep going through that whole cycle over and over again. There's a huge populace out there that just needs that extra gentle care. It's because of that. Maybe the whole populace needs to be treated the same way. And that's really the explanation for why um, we take these universal precautions. Um, Trauma-informed care makes services more accessible to all people and so that they can really continue on the path to recovery. So um, I have two cases here um, that are not real people. They're a compilation of, of um, various patients I've seen along the way, uh, but I thought that it'd be good to kind of keep them in mind um, as we go through this to kind of see how trauma-informed care can help people who have experienced trauma. So um, this is Susanna. She's a 33-year-old woman, recently engaged. She has a history of neglect, parental substance abuse, violence. Uh, her parents, there was a lot of um, partner violence between them. Um, and she started smoking at a young age, at age 12, uh, with friends. Her first boyfriend was physically abusive, um, and she eventually broke up with him. She was able to get through school and go to college, and she works as a legal secretary. She's currently in a relationship, and she's engaged, um, and her fiancé is quite supportive, and she wants to, they want to start a family. So that's um, her motivation for quitting smoking. You know, when, when um, you I saw her in clinic, she appeared um, very motivated. Um, but she has um, a hard time following through. Um, so she kept missing appointments, um, was not really compliant with her medications, and not really following through on commitments and goals she put in place for herself. So the next person I'm going to talk about is Wesley. He's a 56-year-old man, um, unemployed. Um, he has an indigenous background. He had a history of chaotic childhood. He grew up as a crown ward. Uh, he has two children, but he wasn't really around for much of their childhood because um, he was in and out of jail at that time. Um, currently, he takes care of his five-year-old granddaughter, who he absolutely adores and is so devoted to her. And really, she's a huge motivation for why he, he's coming to clinic to stop smoking. Uh, he has a 46-year history of smoking with an average of about um, two packs per day. And he also has some medical problems. He's been diagnosed with COPD, and he has heart disease. Um, when... Um, Wesley came to clinic, he was really unable to sit still in the waiting room. He kind of paced around and kept going in and out of the clinic. Um, when I saw him for his original assessment, he was really reluctant to sit with me 
in my office for the 20 to 30 minutes it takes for me to do an assessment. And I should say that my office is fairly small and doesn't have a window. Um, and he was a little bit threatened in, to be in that space. I also wanted to point out here that you know I was a little bit reluctant to say that um, Wesley um, is indigenous because I didn't want to promote any stereotypes. And at the same time, I do think it's really important to recognize that um, there is um, intergenerational intergenerational trauma that really has a lot of um, long-lasting effects. And um, in this country. Um, many of the indigenous population have a history of, of trauma um, that was caused by residential schools and lots of different things. So I think that cultural aspects and the intergenerational thing is something to keep in mind that we don't often um, think about. So there are two um, influential studies that really set the stage for the development of trauma-informed care. The first is Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, and the second is the Women Co-Occurring Disorders and Violence Study. And I'll talk uh, more about the ACE study, the first study, and I'll touch a bit about this on the second study as well. So um, the Adverse Childhood Experience, or ACE study, was a collaboration between the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and Kaiser Permanente's Health Appraisal Clinic in San Diego, California. And really, this is one of the largest investigations ever conducted to assess the association between childhood maltreatment and later life, health, and well-being. Um, so in the study, more than 17,000 health maintenance organization members who were undergoing a comprehensive physical examination. So they were just um, coming for their regular um, yearly health exam. Um, they agreed to complete a confidential survey regarding their childhood experiences and their current health status and behaviors. And this data was collected uh, between 1995 and 1997. Um, and then there's ongoing surveillance of those study participants. Um, so far, there's been more than 50 journal articles written, and I'm sure there's going to be many more um, still coming up. So this is one of the most widely cited study. So adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, uh, were categorized into three groups. So there was an abuse group, which involved physical abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse. Um, there was neglect, which um, can be physical or emotional. Um, and then household dysfunction, which is, could be uh, mental illness in a member of the family, um, an incarcerated relative, um, if your mother was treated violently, if there was interpartner violence, um, if one of your parents had a substance abuse problem, or divorce. Um, and so each person in the study was assigned an A score. And that was based on the number of these experiences that they endorsed. These are some of the outcomes they looked at. They looked at lots of outcomes, but these are some of the behaviors and physical and mental health outcomes. So um, lack of physical activity, smoking, uh, which is something we're very interested in, alcohol use, drug use, missed work, as well as various um, diseases. So obesity, diabetes, depression, um, cancer, heart disease, COPD, um, lots of different things. So this um, represents the key, the key findings of the ACE studies. Um, they found that ACEs are very common. So two-thirds, you can see here on this little pie chart, two-thirds of study participants reported at least one ACE. 
Um, and then one more than one in five reported more than three ACEs. So that's the dark green and the yellow. Um, you know, they found um, also that there was an association between ACE and negative health and well-being throughout life. And in fact, the data shows that there is a strong dose-response relationship between trauma and poor outcomes. So this means that the greater number of developmental trauma experienced in childhood, the greater the number of illnesses as adults, even after controlling for high-risk um, health behaviors. So for example, compared to an ACE score of zero, having four adverse childhood experiences was associated with a seven-fold increase in alcohol use, um, a doubling the risk of being diagnosed with cancer, and a four-fold increase in emphysema. An ACE score of above six was associated with a 30-fold increase in attempted suicide. This slide shows that dose-response relationship. And that dose-response relationship was also seen with smoking. So they looked at various uh, measures of smoking. And here I've graphed out two of them, so ever smoking um, in blue and early smoking initiation. And you can see that as the A score increases, so does the odds ratio of having this. And it's the same pattern with current smoking and heavy smoking, although I, I don't have those graphed out. So it's a really strong relationship. Here we have the ACE pyramid, um, which um, was done by the CDC. And it really represents the conceptual framework for what we learned from the ACE study. So it aims to illustrate how adverse childhood experiences are strongly related um, to various risk factors for disease throughout the lifespan. Um, so adverse childhood experiences can cause disrupted neurodevelopment. Um, they can disrupt brain circuits um, through epigenetics. They can even affect your genes. They cause social and emotional and cognitive impairment and the adoption of high-risk behaviors, which then cause disease, disability, and social problems and early death. And if you think about the, the two patients I introduced at the beginning, uh, for example, Susanna, you know, she had an ACE score of at least three. We, um, we talked about neglect, um, inter, um, partner violence among her parents, um, and that really caused a disruption in her, in her uh, neurodevelopment, in her brain circuitry, and her, in her genes, um, which caused social and emotional and cognitive impairment. And she did have an early initiation of smoking. She started um, smoking at age 12, um, likely because maybe it, it numbed some of those effects, some of those emotional effects. And if she continues to do it, that can cause more disease, disability, um, and social problems in her life going forward. Um, so with Wesley, we saw that his smoking was probably a contributor to his COPD and his heart disease. You know, the other interesting thing about um, the study is that the majority of respondents were um, Caucasian middle class and had post-secondary education. So I think sometimes we think that um, this applies only to marginalized or at-risk group. But in fact, this data demonstrates that even um, the relatively enfranchised population, the rates of traumatic exposure for children are remarkably high. So they're high throughout, throughout the population. And, um, and that interconnectedness between trauma and substance use and mental health is really profound. So recognizing this connection between trauma and adverse health outcomes, both in substance use and mental health, but also physical health, 
and also the ways in which people who have experienced trauma find health services to be really inaccessible, and they might even be harmful. Um, SAMHSA went about trying to find a better model for behavioral health services that is more suitable and more effective. So this study, um, the WCDVS, or the Women Co-Occurring Disorders and Violence Study, um, looked at outcomes and costs associated with developing and implementing a comprehensive trauma-informed treatment program. So the goal was to produce information and knowledge about integrated services approach for women with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders who also have histories of physical and or sexual abuse. The study was done in two phases. There was a total of 14 sites, and it was conducted over five years um, from 1998 to 2003. And what they found was that integrated trauma-informed models of substance use and mental health treatment were more effective than treatment that was not trauma-informed. Um, and on top of that, it didn't result in increased costs. So the cost was the same. And some of the outcomes they, look at, they looked at was reduction in trauma symptoms, drug use severity, and mental health symptoms. They also, they've written, there's many reports out there that talk about the lessons learned. Um, and from a systems perspective, they found that collaboration, which included consumers, providers, and system planners in all aspects of policy design, implementation, and evaluation, really improved the quality of the work. So this is um, a really interesting study to look into further. So trauma-informed care builds on this by recognizing the need to respond to an individual's intersecting experiences of trauma, mental health, and substance use concerns. Um, and a trauma-informed approach acknowledges that this is achieved not only in specialized services, so not only in um, services that specialize in caring in trauma, um, but also in practical attuned ways at all levels of support and care across all settings. And this definition of trauma-informed care came from, from the study we just discussed. They said that trauma-informed services involve understanding, anticipating, and responding to the issues, expectation, and special needs that a person who has been victimized may have in a particular setting or service. So at a minimum, trauma-informed services endeavor to do no harm. So to avoid re-traumatizing re survivors or blaming them for their efforts to manage their traumatic reactions. And we can um, talk a bit about how this happens. So there's no one way of doing trauma-informed care. Uh, but there are some, you know, um, overarching assumptions and guidelines, and we'll talk about those today. So these are SAMHSA's four R's, so four key assumptions in trauma-informed care. So really, all people at all level of the organization or, or system should have a basic realization about trauma, its widespread impact, and understand the potential path to recovery. Um, we should recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma in the clients, families, and also staff and other people involved with the system. Um, respond by fully integrating knowledge about trauma into, all, into different policies, procedures, and practices. And um, a trauma, lastly, a trauma-informed approach seeks to resist re-traumatization um, of clients as well as staff. So um, there's various organizations 
have come up with key, uh, different key principles and practices, but they're all very, very similar to each other. And these are the ones that are used by the Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse. So trauma awareness, an emphasis on safety and trust, opportunity for choice, collaboration, and connection, and um, also strength-based and skill building. And um, I'm going to talk about each of these uh, principles and practices. Being trauma aware means understanding that trauma is common. And every individual who accesses the health care and social services may have an unknown trauma history. By assuming that all clients, patients may have a trauma history, services can be shaped to minimize the possibility that someone will be re-traumatized. And this is what we refer to as universal precautions. And to do this, we adopt a mindset that views clients as, uh, that are presenting with difficulties, behaviors, and emotions as responses to trauma. Um, and we do this about smoking as well. So instead of asking, what's wrong with this person? Why are they behaving in this way? We ask, what ha what's happened to this person um, that makes them present like this? So trauma um, can affect um, how people engage with services. And we talk about trauma as being a normal response to abnormal events. Uh, people present with all sorts of responses. Um, and there are responses that maybe were adaptive at some point to the abnormal events that they had gone through. And when people present like that um, to our services, um, we need to understand it in that way. So for example, Wesley, who we talked about uh, before, was physically abused as a child. Um, he was in a situation in which he felt trapped and escape was impossible. And so now he feels claustrophobic and it's hard for him to be in small places. So it was hard for him to be in the waiting room, and he needed to walk around, and he needed to go outside. And it was hard for him to sit in my office, actually impossible for him to sit in my, my office. So we can help um, by finding out what would be helpful in the moment. So for um, Wesley, for example, um, it was easier to wait outside, so just outside the clinic doors, until his turn came for his appointment, and then someone could go out and call him to come in. Also, because our initial assessment was longer and he didn't feel like he could sit there for that long, we ended up going someplace outside and sitting on a bench and discussing it. Um, so we were able to make adaptations um, in order to facilitate this for him. When we look at Susanna, she says that she's motivated, but doesn't really follow through with her appointments, treatments, or even commitments that she makes to herself. And when you first look at it, it seems that maybe she doesn't really care. Uh, maybe she's not really committed. Um, and yet, when you look at her behavior from a trauma lens, it makes sense if you look at the contact context in which she grew up. So um, in her past, no one followed through on promises they made her. Um, no one really respected her, cared about her, and so it makes sense that she doesn't respect herself right now enough to, to follow through on commitments and show up. Um, her cigarettes were really the only thing that was there for her, and so she feels um, a connection with those cigarettes, um, and it's hard to quit that. It's hard to stop that. Um, so having a trauma-aware lens really helps us understand this, and then we can help um, Susanna um, understand what happened to her, if she's interested in that, if she's interested in going there.
So what can we do in our smoking cessation practice? Um, we can recognize past and current experiences of trauma as potential risk factors for smoking um, because we know that um, smoking can be a form of coping with the effects of trauma. Right? People try, uh, use smoking to deal with it, their negative affect. We can screen for trauma, and this isn't necessary in trauma-informed care. Um, we should be treating people um, with the assumption that they may have had trauma in their life. But when we do screen for trauma, then it helps us direct people to the right services. So we can learn about local programs and services that provide trauma-specific treatment, and we can um, offer those to our patients if they're interested. Also, knowing that um, a person may have had trauma in their life, we can normalize that it may take longer for them to quit smoking. And that's very validating for our patient. So I, the key point is, is rather than viewing smoking as a problem in itself, trauma awareness really helps with understanding that smoking is an attempt to cope with other problems. Safety is a necessary first step for building strong and trustworthy relationship, service engagement, and, healthy, and healing. People who have experienced trauma often feel unsafe on an ongoing basis. Um, and some of them may still be involved in an unsafe relationship and may be in danger. Many people who have experienced trauma um, also have experienced boundary violations and abuse of power in relationships. Um, so an awareness of safety and, need, and so safety is really important. And when we talk about safety, we talk about physical, emotional, spiritual, and cultural safety. And so that's in our, in our um, clients or patients. But also within our organization, an awareness of safety and needs of the healthcare provider and clinic staff is also crit critically important. So here I've listed um, some safety provisions um, in order to make the environment a bit more safe and welcoming. So these involve implementing welcoming intake procedures, um, adapting the physical space to be less threatening, providing clear and practical information about what to expect and rationale for processes. So that really puts boundaries on things. Um, individually tailoring smoking interventions, taking into account gender biases, culture, and societal hindrances, for example, poverty. Um, in our organization, this might be implementing debriefing practices, opportunities for self-care, resilient training, paid leave, supervision, peer support um, for our staff. Um, it's also important for all staff members to learn how to recognize signs of burnout, vicarious trauma, and compassion fatigue in themselves and in other coworkers, and to know how to access counseling and other supportive services. Um, so I see there's a question about how to make physical space less threatening. You know, sometimes it's possible and sometimes you have to make other adaptations. So for example, um, the small room I was in um, when Wesley came wasn't ideal for someone who suffered trauma because it's a small room, someone might feel enclosed in it, um, it had no window. But it might be moving to a different room that is a bit bigger, that has a window. Um, it might be um, in the waiting room having uh, posters that explain what's about to happen, explains a bit more about the programming so people know what to expect. Um, trust is built through safe and predictable interactions. And I like this quote by Maya Angelou. Um, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel.
Um, so opportunities for choice, collaboration, and connection are part of trauma-informed care. Um, healthcare providers often represent power and control to individuals who have experienced trauma, and this can be really frightening and overwhelming. Um, and this is because people who have experienced trauma often feel powerless uh, with little control over what has happened to them. So offering them choice gives them can more control and responsibility. And choice can relate to all aspects of service. So for example, just asking the person how they would like to be addressed. Um, would they like to be called by their first name, a nickname, title and family name? What pronoun would they like us to use when we're addressing them? How they would like to be contacted? Um, talking to patients about the type, the timing, and the pace of intervention when we're doing smoking cessation um, can help empower them and give them choice and helping, letting them determine their level of participation. So trauma survivors respond best um, to situations that establish collaboration and sharing power. So clinically, service providers are able to share their knowledge, experience, and access to resources. And clients can share their own ideas of what might work and draw upon their personal resources and strengths. So um, this is actually sounds a lot like motivational interviewing, and motivational interviewing um, can be part of trauma-informed care. They have a lot of similar philosophy. On an organizational level, service users may be involved in evaluating services. Uh, they may form service user advisory councils that provide advice on service design as well as service users' rights and grievances. And that might help, um, help them have a voice and really help actually their organization grow. Positive and safe connections um, with service providers, peers, and the wider community is really important in promoting healing and encouraging further engagement with care and support. So when you're thinking about this, you can, thinking, you can think, does my smoking cessation approach cultivate a model that is doing with rather than to or for? So a strength-based approach to service delivery really recognizes the abilities and resilience of trauma survivors. It fosters empowerment um, and supports an organization culture of, of learning and growth. Um, and so I think that is really um, important to do. Um, a strength-based perspective focuses on what works and how to do more of what works rather than what's wrong with this person. Trauma-informed care recognizes symptoms as originating from adaptations to the traumatic events or context. Validating resilience is important even when past coping behavior are now causing problems. Understanding a symptom as an adaptation reduces a survivor's guilt and shame. It increases their self-esteem and provides guidelines for developing new skills and resources to allow new and better adaptations to the current situation. So it allows patients to be more compassionate with themselves. Um, and for example, Susanna, you know, it may have been that when she was 12, smoking was the only coping mechanism she had. And that's what kept her going. That's, that's what allowed her to, to manage and to, to get through her teenage years to when she was an adult. Um, and now that, that very same coping mechanism we're seeing is not a good thing and it's not benefiting her. And it's hard to take that away, but I think it's, it's really important to validate that this was there for her. Um, so I, I tell my patients things like, wow, you've survived a lot. Tell me how you did.
did that. Um, and help them really conceptualize the strengths and sources of resilience because she is really resilient. She was able to undergo a lot and still, you know, she's working, she's engaged now. And, and using those strengths to move forward. Um, so if you see smoking as a sequela of trauma, then you know, we really have to help our clients or our patients learn alternative ways of dealing with this underlying cause. Um, and to do that, we need to, pr to help them build skills such as coping skills, self-regulation skills, self-care skills, compassion, other skills for recognizing triggers and managing trauma responses. And you know some of these skills are also really important in our in in our staff. So skills such as mindfulness um, can promote wellness and service providers and reduce burnout and vicarious trauma. So I just wanted to highlight one of these skills that I, I one of my favorite skills for using and teaching. Um, my clients, uh, which is grounding. Um, grounding is a way of detaching from emotional pain uh, by staying present. So sometimes it's called centering, looking outwards, distraction, or healthy detachment. It's particularly powerful because it can be applied to any situation um, where patients are caught in emotional pain. So when they're triggered, um, and it can be done at any time, anywhere, by oneself without anyone else noticing. So grounding is not a relaxation exercise. It's a highly active strategy that works via distraction and connection to the external world. Uh, patients are asked to keep their eyes open, and you're really teaching um, patients to notice everything they can about the world in front of them and about the present. And by doing so, to recognize that right now in the present, they are safe. So when they're flooded by emotions, and I can see people you know, di um, dissociating, I ask them to do grounding. So I encourage them to maybe look around the room to describe to themselves the colors, the shapes, um, the images they see. Um, some people like physical grounding, so they like to carry um, an object with them. It might be um, a favorite rock or a favorite object, and they can feel that. They can notice the texture, the, the, the temperature of, of the object, and that really helps center them and take them back to the present as opposed to the intense emotions that they're experiencing at the moment. So um, it's a really useful skill to, to look up and to have um, at your fingertips. So we're getting to the end of our presentation. And um, hopefully, these are some of the take-home points you can take from this talk. Um, trauma is an experience that overwhelms a person's capacity to cope. Um, it's extremely common, especially in the populations that we see. And it has widespread impact. Um, it, is, it does have a strong association with smoking. Trauma-informed care applies universal precautions to decrease the risk of re-traumatization, and so I really encourage everyone to use that in their organization. Um, Trauma-informed care really views problem behaviors as attempts to cope with traumatic experiences. So specifically in smoking cessation practices, we view smoking as an attempt to cope with um, trauma symptoms. There's an emphasis on safety, trustworthiness, choice, and collaboration. And we try and empower our clients and really provide hope. And um, I'm going to end with that because I think that's really um, one of the most important points is providing hope that recovery is possible. People can and do heal from both trauma and substance use, including smoking. So both are possible, and I think it's, it's our place to hold that for our um, clients who may or may not believe it at the, in the moment. 
Um, so I think we have a few minutes to answer questions. So one of the questions earlier on was what leads a patient from um, trauma to PTSD? And um, you know, that's, that's a really big question. And we don't know everything, but there's things that make people more at risk. So multiple traumas, um, sometimes genetics, um, sometimes other, the environment that they're in, um, whether they've got other um, mental or physical illness. Um, and sometimes people will have several traumas and not experience PTSD, but the symptoms will only come about later after an additional trauma happens. So it's kind of um, the straw that breaks the camel's back. I think that's the expression. Um, the, another question was, it sounds like a deep relationship they have developed with their cigarettes. Um, that friend we all hear about. Um, and, and I think I think smoking is um, people do form a really strong attachment with smoking. Um, I think smoking helps people regulate their affect early on. And when when people, especially in childhood or when they're in a traumatic situation, they probably have um, very few resources. Um, and so this is something that might help them and help them at the time get out of it. And it might be the only thing they could have done in the past. So Susanna, for example, and Wesley started smoking at a young age, and maybe they had no choice. They really couldn't do much um, when they were that young. And so it's something that they really hold on to, and it's some, one of the only things that's been there for them. So I think addressing that when you're talking about smoking cessation and addressing about grieving that and learning new skills is important. Um, So there's a question about the ACE questionnaire, and it is available. I think there is um, through the CDC website. There are various questionnaires to ask people about ACEs. Um, and I think I saw a question about screening for trauma. Um, and I just ask people if they have experienced um, a traumatic event in their past um, when I'm doing my initial assessment. Um, but it could be part of a questionnaire that you give people when they first enter the um, your service. It can happen in, in a variety of different ways. OK, I'm going to pass the microphone back to Stephanie. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaffney. That was a very informative webinar. webinar. And thank you to everyone who asked questions in the discussion board. Uh, this webinar has been recorded, and I will be distributing the link to the recording along with the slides uh, this afternoon. So remember, a link to the post-learning assess post assessment will be sent by email this afternoon, and you'll have one week to complete this to receive a letter of completion. And if you participated as a group, please make sure to email teach at camh.ca with a list of groups or uh, participants from your group by 2 p.m. Our next Teach Educational Rounds webinar is on October 17th, and that will be on clinical practice framework for working with clients of African descent. And that will be presented by Donna Alexander. As well, we do have a special cannabis webinar series. This is not part of our accreditation program, but I will also send a link to registration for that as well. And that will be taking place on October 10th, the very first webinar for that. And again, if you have missed today's presentation, are interested in viewing it again, or you are interested in viewing previous webinars, a list of our archived webinars are found on our website, and you can view them there. Thank you, everyone, and have a great week. <laughs>